Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Did you know that Wisconsin wins more national and international cheese awards than any other state or country? To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hey, hey, you're listening to Eat Your Words on Heritage Radio Network, and I'm your host, Kathy Irway. Um, so I don't need to tell anyone that we live in some rather divisive times right now, and that one of the most divisive topics of the last year in our national debate has been about immigration. Um, and, you know, at least in my lifetime, I think we've been hearing the most anti-immigrant rhetoric coming from and policies coming from the White House. So, um, you know, almost immediately, ah, almost immediately, though, I feel that there was a palpable resistance coming from the food media world. Um, maybe that's just the world that I live in, but... I mean, it has been vocal. There's been features in Bon Appetit, for instance, about, you know, highlighting immigration, how great it's been to our food. And nobody can really deny that, you know, we're not all the better for pizza and uh, hummus and baba ganoush and gyoza and whatever. You know, it's 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 a great topic to explore. And we've seen a lot of it from, you know, hashtags to blog posts celebrating it. But now... Fortunately, we have a cookbook that celebrates the immigrant experience in food. And it is called The Immigrant Cookbook, Recipes That Make America Great. I am so thrilled to be joined with the editor of this book. And it com came out just this winter um, from Interlink Publishing. And it's the editor, Layla Mushabek. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. It's happy to be here. So tell me a little bit about how this project came about. Were you also feeling like the need to to celebrate immigrant food culture in the last, I don't know, what happened? <laughs> well, you know, at Interlink Publishing, we've always uh, published book that, books that promote cultural understanding. Mm -hmm. um, that's been our focus, uh, particularly with our cookbooks. Um, but I think, like many others, um, in the last couple of years, we really felt this need to, to have a more direct impact and to, to use our soapbox in, in the best way that we can. So we, we launched a couple of years ago this initiative um, to uh, publish kind of fundraising cookbooks, mm -hmm. beginning with a, a cookbook called Soup for Syria, uh, Recipes That Celebrate Our Shared Humanity, which gathered soup recipes from around the world, um, from internationally known chefs, to raise money for the UNHCR um, mm -hmm and provide um, medical and uh, food relief for Syrian refugees. Um, and I think, you know, this really sparked our, uh, our kind of new series of cookbooks that, that awesome. do this. And this, this, the Immigrant Cookbook is our, is our latest one. And um, 
was kind of a, a following on to this and, and really dealt with a more uh, kind of homegrown mm-hmm. issue f- for sure and one that was really deeply important to me personally as well as the company. I love that the the mission and the results are twofold. You know, this cookbook is a fundraiser for the ACLU. So you're actually putting money towards the, the charity. Yes, so yeah. A portion of the proceeds mm-hmm. is donated to the ACLU uh, specifically for their immigrants' rights project to kind of more directly impact um, the... You Legal know, funds. Yeah, sure, yeah. the um, immigrants in this country. But also we hope that the, the book will bring immigrant stories and the people and and, um, and uh, uh, cultures behind our favorite foods mm-hmm. uh, to, together to, to the American public. Yeah, <laughs> and creating compassion and understanding through food. I love that you, you really spelled that out in the beginning. You're like, you know, food is this important bridge to understanding cultures. And um, it's, it's seen throughout the pages. So... So for po- folks who haven't seen this book, it's um, a compilation of these amazing contributors who are chefs, activists, um, cookbook writers, and so forth, each contributing one recipe. It's sort of like a family or pot- <laughs> like church potluck cookbook yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the book features nearly 80 contributors who represent um, about 60 countries of origin. And we really wanted to uh, feature a diverse range of people, not just ethnically, but also uh, professionally, just to show the kind of scope of influence. So we um, have gathered well-known Michelin starred and James Beard award-winning restaurant Daniel chefs. Daniel Balud, right. And then there's the old guard and the new guard, too. Yeah, yeah, as well as food writers, TV hosts, but also small food producers and emerging food writers and kind of just the people behind favorite neighborhood spots. Um, yeah, I love learning about the folks that I didn't kn- know about yet. So yeah, this really helps you know introduce a lot of people to their work. Yeah, they're not all people that we'll have heard of, but they're mm-hmm. they're all kind of impacting their local communities uh, through food, which is really interesting. And you read that each of these contributors serves as a culinary ambassador for their culture. Um, I, I'm just I love that phrase, and I love that um, it is taken on so much meaning. Um, today, do you think that has always been the case for folks who are just like I don't know, slinging pizzas at their local trattoria, um, you know, taking on this responsibility of educating? And uh... I mean, it's like it's. I think um, you know, I think for for most people who are who love their food, they also love to share their food. I think mm-hmm. that that those two things go hand in hand. Um, and so, uh, and and food is so intricately tied to our culture, our sense of home, heritage, our family backgrounds, um, our traditions, that that um, it's always been a way to promote cultural understanding, whether intended or not. Mm. Um, yeah. But at the but same... conscious, yeah. At the same time, I think right now, um, there's just a, a drive, a, a moment to really kind of uh, resist some of the really negative rhetoric surrounding um, other cultures and other countries and immigrant populations in this country. So I think people are uh, standing up and, and, and talking about it in a more um, direct way than perhaps mm-hmm. in the past. Um, as a cook, you mentioned in the introduction that you love that, you know, you're making traditional foods for your, for your family and you're trying to like learn through, you know, phone calls with your parents and other relatives how to recreate something from um, your heritage. Yeah. Is that, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, th- I well, we. I feel like we all do that. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I come from a, an immigrant background. My parents are both immigrants. Um, my husband's family. My husband is an immigrant, and so I think we all kind of, in our own cooking, gather the the, the different cultures that we've grown up with and are surrounded by, and we all have these phone conversations with back home. Um, for for me, food is a way to to connect to my heritage. I'm second generation, so sometimes that connection is, is not always super direct, but, but um, learning about the, the um, you know, the, the ways that my grandmother cooked things and my aunts and, and the, the arguments internally <laughs> my family has about how much of what spice to add is, uh, is, is a way for me to yet yeah, kind of really uh, understand and, and 
and, kind and of, important to pass on to your children. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I mean, so this cookbook, I really love that um, it's not like you're taking 60 or so cuisines or cultures or countries and trying to write about the immigrant history of them and some recipes from them. It's You're really like sort of stepping back and letting each of the contributors speak for themselves and tell their own stories in their own words, in their own food, in their own recipes and so forth. But... Um, how exactly did you find these people? How did you approach them about what recipe to contribute? Um, well, you know, we we uh, we approached each contributor and asked them to to share a recipe that really signified to them their their immigrant experience, uh, and we asked that it be something that would was appropriate to recreate at home without lots of special professional equipment or anything like that. But beyond that, we didn't really provide a lot of um, kind rules. of guidelines yeah. or rules because we really wanted it to to be we wanted each contributor to kind of interpret that in the way that was most important to them so some of them provided recipes that were are, are very very traditional um, from their home countries some of them provide kind of kind of modern interpretations of mm-hmm. traditional recipes that use local ingredients or that are influenced by people around them um and some of them are some of the recipes are, are kind of culturally unspecific, but you know are important to the to chef's journey and their, their own. story. Yeah, yeah. And still, you managed to come up with like this wonderful um, categories where there seems to be a good number of salads and you know soups and then yeah. chicken dishes and desserts and so forth. Well, I mean, I I think um, you know if if you think about trying to pick one recipe that exemplifies something that's really personal to you it's, it's really hard to choose just one so I think a lot of them you know in conversations with the chef, chefs a lot of them had more than one option and we mm-hmm. kind of talked about what might might work best um, also you know it's there were um, different contributors who specialized in different things like you know we it was likely that Dominique Ansel would provide a sweet recipe uh-huh. or Lauren Chun of um, mother-in-law's kimchi, yeah, would yeah. give us a recipe for for kimchi, so that you know there were things, there were certain expectations <laughs> right. that we could have, but we kind of tried to approach it with a really open mind and and and, and didn't know exactly what, what shape it would take, mm-hmm. but um, it came together really well. It's a really really great array, and I loved reading about each contributor. Um, was I, ha- I? I'm sorry, I just have to ask this, but was there any contributor on your wish list that you're like? I just wish I got that person. And then for some reason they were too busy or something to participate. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, the thing is that's funny is like, since the book came out, I've read so many articles or, or listened to podcasts and thought, why didn't I call this person? Why didn't we try <laughs> right. to, you know, there's, I'm constantly hearing about interesting new people. And there were definitely a few chefs that, um, we approached and who were, who are eager, but because of scheduling, it didn't. Right. Um, yeah. It didn't work out for what one reason or another, but um, but you know, actually, remarkably, a lot of the the chefs were really, really excited about this. Mm-hmm. You know, and we we approached people who were immensely famous and um, or have you know multiple restaurants and are incredibly busy people, busy. and they all really made time for this. And I think that's a kind of it's a really hopeful time for our future when people are uh, so eager to come together and share their stories for this kind of yeah I was, I was struck by the just the scope of it you have um, recipe from Jose Andres yeah um, and uh, April Bloomfield which we you know we don't think of as like immigrant may not be the first thing that comes to mind but she was from England She's, yeah um, then we have the you know the younger folks like Josh Koo and Trig Brown of Winston down the street yeah, um, who are just stepping out and doing their thing with the Taiwanese food. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's an incredible selection of of people and voices, but it 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 comes together in a really yeah. Now you were saying that you sort of said that you know try to make things more accessible. Don't go too crazy with uh, I don't know uh, hard to find techniques or equipment. But I thought that you know some of the most interesting parts is learning about these really traditional techniques and equipment use like um for example um the gazan mortar and pestle made with red clay or sid sibdia that leila el haddad said um she uses for this salad this um 
sort of pulsed or um, uh, dressing in the salad that is sort of pounded. And, um, you know, I just love learning about those little things, even if I'm never going to use one. It's just good to know. Yeah. I I mean, I think that one of the really beautiful themes that comes through um, when you read through the stories is uh, the ways that we use food as a kind of connection to our homelands and where we come from. And, uh, you know, Ana Sofia Pelez also talks about about that, about the, the, you know, kind of treasuring these few objects that her family brought with her from Cuba. And and, uh, Leila Haddad talks about her um, Zib- Zibdia, which Zibdia? I'm, okay. <laughs> being a, um, which I'm probably not pronouncing correctly, but um, being this like symbol of of um, you know her her homeland, which is often this unattainable reality away, as she mm-hmm. uh, as she puts it. So um, um, allowing her to kind of taste home wherever she she goes, which I think is such a, a beautiful sentiment and one that we we all have these treasured tools or family recipes or heirlooms in our own kitchen mm-hmm. that we connect um, to food. So I mean, this was something that was immensely important to the recipes and to the chefs. So, you know, it was important to us to leave those things in. Um, but on the other hand, these are also ingredients, uh, I'm sorry, recipes and dishes that have, that have traveled with these chefs right. here and are recreated and in, yeah. in, 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 in a new land with new ingredients and new availability. So a lot of them, you know, we didn't really have to put a lot of specifications on people to make it accessible to American households because they are. They are cooked in American households They're across doing the it country. themselves. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's lovely to to read about all those um, artifacts too. I just yeah, uh, like Layla had said, you know, you you have a piece of that that homeland when you have like something like that in your kitchen. Yeah, I, um, that her what, her story was particularly beautiful to me. Mm-hmm. And- um, we're gonna cut to a quick little commercial interlude and be right back chatting more. Today's program was brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. What do you think of when you hear Wisconsin Cheese? For me, I think cheese curds. Delicious, fresh and squeaky cheese curds. Or deep fried cheese curds. Cheese curds literally anyway, anytime, any place. I think about Andy Hatch and Upland's Cheese, the farmstead cheese company behind Pleasant Ridge Reserve. I think of delicious, stinky Limburger and its long storied history. I think of Dunbarton Blue, made by master cheesemaker Chris Raleigh. I think of Roth's Grand Cru Sirchois, which was named 2016's World Championship Cheese, and Satori's Black Pepper Bella Vitano, the 2017 U.S. Championship Cheese. Wisconsin produces the world's best cheese, with lush grasslands and a glacial water supply that produce the very best milk. Fourth-generation cheesemakers combine old-world tradition with new ideas and the highest standards to make innovative cheeses that win more awards than any other state or country. To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. All right, we're back chatting more with Leila Mushabek. She is the editor of the Immigrant Cookbook. Let's talk for a moment about the subtitle. It is Recipes That Make America Great. I love that. <laughs> you just sort of lay down the gauntlet from the beginning and, you know, it's as a response. Do you see this cookbook as a response or a political statement? Um, you know, first and foremost, this is a book about really good people and, um, and really good food and the people behind it. So, you know, I think it, it stands up to any time in American history. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly. You know, I'm, immigrant cuisine has uh, influenced our food culture since long before the 2016 election, but... Uh, in this moment, in this particular moment, um, I think bringing together these strong immigrant voices is a statement in itself. Uh, yeah. And I don't like to see it as a res- as a response, but I I do see it as a kind of celebration, uh, kind of reclaiming this concept of America being great um, and the things that that make it great. I, I, you know, uh, I think. Uh, Diversity has been a fundamental strength of American culture, mm-hmm. you know, since its its beginnings. 
And it's fun to see, yeah, what uh, what people respond to when you when you ask them to contribute a dish. Now, I, you know, picked up on some themes that, you know, as I mentioned, some traditional um, techniques or ingredients that people elaborated on in their introduction, which I thought was really interesting. And um, I, I thought it was really interesting to note that some of these recipes uh, seem very flexible. Um, you can, you know, for instance, you can swap in seasonal produce that is found here. Um, for XYZ, like um, this Lebanese peasant salad or fatouche that Barbara Abdeni Massad writes, um, she makes with whatever seasonal produce she has. Um, so yeah. that's another theme I've been seeing. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, well, I think I think a lot of dishes globally are like that, are flexible to the seasons they're made in, and um, you know, I I think that's uh it's one of my favorite ways personally to cook um mm-hmm. as well so it's kind of use what you have and and i think a lot of home cooking is like that and a lot of the contributors shared home cooking because that's what was sort of personally important to them um uh but i also think that that uh the nature of of the the dishes that were brought here are often flexible to different ingredients and and um climates and uh you know, Barbara's dish is wonderful as well, and a good example of it. Another one, um, which I really love, is Nadia Hobi and Dina Kabakibi's um, kanafe, which is a sweet cream pastry that's soaked in orange blossom syrup. And um, it's a it's a sort of traditionally Palestinian dish, often served for breakfast, uh, but it's popular throughout the Middle East and made with kind of various local cheeses. Mm. Um, the the contributors are, are of Syrian origin, and when they were recreating their family's version, they found that the the closest um, the closest cheese that they could find that most closely resembled the cheeses that they would have used in Syria was Mexican queso fresco mm. and crema, yeah. which they mixed together. And so the dishes are also inspired by kind of other cultures and. Uh, mm-hmm. That that are encountered here in the U.S., which I that's also cool. really liked. That's <laughs> cool. That's really interesting origin story or evolution story. Um, I love that you know that everybody seems to exude a sense of pride about their food culture too. Um, I love that uh, Daniel Baloud, he had a, a recipe for a salad with frisé and uh, a poached egg and lardons, and uh, he said it's something that he served in his restaurants forever. But he said, I chose this because it is just so French. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, I could just hear that. I don't know why. <laughs> and it is so good, too. Um, no kidding. Uh, all these dishes look really good. Um, do you have any favorites? You know, I. it's really, I, I kind of spent, I feel like during the editorial process, I spent so much time with a lot of these dishes and mm. a lot of them. I think are really really special. I feel like there's it's really hard to choose just a couple. Uh-huh. Um, there's a few that kind of have made it into my daily repertoire for sure. Um, mm-hmm. I love Reem Asil's Muhammad, which is a, um, a red pepper and walnut uh, oh. dip with oh, garlic yeah. and olive oil and pomegranate molasses. That is, is super easy and a so healthy, good and versatile. Party, party perfect. Yeah. yeah. And it's become kind of a regular, it's pretty much always in my fridge now. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, I, lo- I love Tende Wei's jollof rice dish, Ooh. which is, um, you know, uh, this beautiful, um, smoky Nigerian rice dish that when he first sent me the recipe, I, I, I was like, oh, okay, a rice dish. You know, I wasn't, I was, you know, interested in it, but I wasn't, you know. You couldn't uh, taste it yet. But when, yeah. <laughs> when we, during shooting, I became a believer because it is the most flavorful dish. Um, mm. You cook the rice in a, a puree of tomatoes and peppers. And um, and my, my son, who was 10 months old at the time, I was, I told 10 day later, pretty much only wanted to eat jollof rice for, <laughs> for, for weeks on end. So it's been also been a regular um, oh feature. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you must be like very well traveled from editing this book in, in, you know, virtual sense. Well, I, I think, oh, it's definitely, um, definitely got me out of my comfort zone when uh-huh. cooking. I've definitely tried some things that I've never tried before and that I probably, you know, I, I've obviously I'm a cookbook editor, so I'm interested in 
in cuisines from all over the world by <laughs> by nature, I guess. Yeah. But but this definitely um, took me to places that I've not, that I've not been, and they're totally. you know they're they're on our doorstep. These are all um, you know American kind of cuisines or that cuisines that make up part of the American culinary landscape. So um, it's it's they're not uh, once you start kind of veering into that territory, they're not hard to find or or uh, difficult to explore. Or or yeah or. What would you say to somebody who's like a little bit uncomfortable with making some dish from a culture that they really know nothing about? Is it is that like the a great entry point to learning more? Or um, I think it can, yeah, yeah, I think it definitely can be. I think um, you know, f- food is is just innately important to any society, and um, it's often linked in a very personal way to to culture and traditions, community. Uh, and so when you when you cook a dish, you're you're bringing it into your home. You're you're um, sharing it with your own family. Uh, you're kind of uh, when you read the stories behind those dishes, you you are connecting with a with somebody in a personal way. Um, and I think sometimes simple interaction like that can be um, a really good way to promote cultural understanding. There there, I, I don't I think uh, I don't think it's a given. I think that that. Uh, that you have to want to learn a little bit more about the cultures mm-hmm. behind those dishes. We all encounter uh, food and eat foods every day that we we don't know who, where they came from, or mm-hmm. we don't think about where they came from, or who prepared them. But um, I think it, it, you know, it's I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge those people, particularly mm-hmm. now. <laughs> yeah, and and particularly now, I think that there's a lot of debate about. The idea of somebody uh, serving, profiting off of food from another culture. Um, what would you say to somebody who's sort of like uh, serving as a middleman or culinary ambassador of a culture that is not their own exactly? Um, you know, like I said, I think um, I think it's completely natural to uh, be inspired by and interested in global cuisines um i i uh i think that uh <laughs> sorry, <it's, laughs> sorry i'm just thinking thinking this through but i think but i think it, you know there's also like an important uh conversation to be had about um appropriation and profiting from um other people's cuisines particularly if that group is marginalized uh i think i think it's important to acknowledge those those cultures and peoples and experiences behind behind those dishes um and i think sometimes particularly with you know immigrant groups in this country um we we can we enjoy the the gifts that they have brought to our culture all the time whether we acknowledge it or not but i think that contribution is often overlooked mm mm-hmm. mhm and like you said, you can find these foods at, you know, people making them all the time at the local, you know, small stores, small restaurants and so forth. It doesn't have to be a five star <laughs> Michelin yeah, I mean, experience. Oh, it's, I think immigrants have um, kind of shaped our culinary landscape, not just in terms of the foods we eat, which has been immense. I mean, every food that you think of as being an American food has pretty much has originated with an immigrant group or mm-hmm. um um but also uh you know so many of the incredible chefs that really driving american food culture are first or second generation immigrants but also from an economic perspective um immigration has huge huge implications for our food industry uh, immigrants legal as well as undocumented make up the vast majority of the labor force of our farms. Right. You're saying like 80% of farm works here, farm workers are foreign born. Yeah. Of our, of our, um, like food production factories, grocery stores, restaurant kitchens, slaughterhouses. Yeah. Yeah, It's everything. Everything, um, you know, is, is sort of driven by our, an immigrant workforce for force, um, you know, often facing really hard, work with low pay and, and few few benefits um, so you know I think I think uh, there are aspects to the contribution which are which are overlooked and uh, which we forget about and we might stand to you know if if policy changes we might stand to 
really wreak havoc into all our, I mean, as they stand, systems. So it's something to it, think about. It impacts, too. you know, I think every level of our of our kind of food system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we eat. Yes. yes. <laughs> totally. Um, well, I, I really appreciate why, you know, this book covers so much ground and that it, you know, it also directly impacts the ACLU by donating to them. So you can um, you can get a copy and know that at least $5 from the purchase will be donated to the ACLU. Yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah, and it, will, it goes specifically to their Immigrants' Rights Project, which you can read more about on our website, um, which is immigrantcookbook.net. And um, there's a link there that you can donate directly to the ACLU as well. Perfect. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. But thank you so much, Layla, for joining us and telling us more about this book, which I hope everyone gets their hands on soon. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thanks, everyone at Heritage. We'll see you next. Ah, we'll see you next week on Eat Your Words. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Ever wonder what kind of podcast Julia Child would have made? Probably would have been one where she introduced you to all of her latest discoveries and favorite people. And that's exactly the tradition we're following on Inside Julia's Kitchen, the podcast of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. Join me, Todd Shulkin, your host, and the Foundation's Executive Director, as I bring you inside the Foundation's world to meet the bright lights of today's food universe, just as Julia used to do from her own famous kitchen. New episodes air on Heritage Radio Network, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Listen in.